Good morning, all. Um, the next session uh, would be abstract uh, present. questions. Um, I will be introducing the chair for this session, who is Professor Dr. Sinclair Davison. Uh, Professor Sinclair Davison, please, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Solomon, how are you? I'm okay. Good morning. Good morning. Well, good yes. evening in, in, in my particular <laughs> okay. case. It's, uh, I thought it was absolutely wonderful. It's it's 9 a.m. in London. It's uh, 5 p.m. in Singapore. It's 8 p.m. in Australia. And this is a wonderful, wonderful thing that technology is actually bringing us together all around the world um, in order to, to, to share our knowledge, our ideas, our thinking on this fantastic new technology blockchain. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Um, I'm really looking forward to the three presentations that we have uh, going on today. Um, we will be scoring them as I've told the speakers backstage. I will be receiving um, offers of, 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 of Bitcoin or ETH as the case may be, um, but I'm, I'm certainly expecting we're going to have some very exciting discussions and, and, and great learnings uh, for, from our efforts here today. So thank you very much to our speakers and I'm really looking forward to uh, what you have to share with us. So, uh, Pro Professor Davidson, you have about five minutes to, to talk about uh, who you are, which institution you're from, what does your institution do, uh, and so on. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, uh, my name is Sinclair Davidson. I am a professor of economics at the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub. We are based in Melbourne. We were set up, oh, I'd say about two or three years ago um, with uh, some very generous funding from our university to investigate the blockchain. Um, we are actually not a technical group, so we don't have computer scientists as you would expect normally in a blockchain group. We are actually a group of economists, lawyers, sociologists, and accountants. Um, so we are looking at the social science aspects. We are looking at the business aspects. Uh, we're looking at the business models that are going to be going into this technology that are going to be appearing over the few years. So we are mostly interested in how this technology is going to contribute to human flourishing. Um, we are not uh, techno-pessimists, we're actually a group of te techno-optimists. We believe that the world is going to be a better place, a more exciting place, and quite frankly, a more human place as a result of this technology. We will actually be able to live longer, fuller, more human lives because at the at the, at the base of this technology is the fact that it's a peer-to-peer -peer technology. This is a technology which links us not as human to institution, but links us as human to human. So we will be able to interact with people, like-minded people or trading partners all around the world without the intermediation of large centralized organizations. So our view is that the Industrial Revolution had this incredible impact of industrializing energy. And so the industrialization of energy led to great levels of centralization around the world. What this new technology, what this blockchain does is it industrializes trust. So we are not of the opinion that is a trustless technology. Um, we are of the opinion that this is industrialized trust. And every time we see a change in trust technology in the world, we see a change in organizational structures. So this industrialization of trust is actually going to make it easier for us to interact on a, on a, on a human level at scale, something which we have been able to do before. Before, we've always been able to interact at a human level with a small number of people. So 12 to 20 people on an intimate basis, maybe 250 people or so on, on an extended basis. This technology is going to allow us to, to interact with other people on a trusted basis at scale, thousands of people, strangers, people we don't know, people we'll never meet again. Um, so we are incredibly excited by the opportunities around this. Um, and and we've, I think we've been able to, to infect other people with our excitement too. 
Um, projects that we are working on, we, we've taken upon ourselves being academics to be in an educative role. Our notion is to educate society at large, because bearing in mind this is a, a newfangled technology and people are suspicious of the new very often. So we need to educate society at large, um, civil society. We need to educate politicians and, and, and decision makers, because for them also, this is very new and very different. And, you know, again, they're going to be a bit suspicious of new and different. So we have to educate them as well. Uh, we have to educate industry. Now, part of that education role of industry is traditional industry adopting this new technology. Um, there, there, there's, there's a lot of excitement there. There's a lot of fear there. And so the opportunity is there to do a lot of work. And then also the developers of the blockchain technology. These people very often um, are computer scientists. They don't have the, the, the broad spectrum of skills necessary to sell this technology. So that's why we've put together a team of social scientists um, in order to explore and embed the social aspects of this technology into our society. So uh, uh, we're very excited. We hope you are very excited. We, we, we're trying to excite as many people as we possibly can, uh, more or less spreading the good word that uh, there, there is a better life. There, there is a peer-to-peer -peer technology um, that is going to allow us to 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 grow and prosper, flourish as human beings. And yes, I I see on the chat it is 4 a.m. in Chicago. A, a very early good morning to you two. Thank you for coming. Um, so Nassim, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if there are, or actually just jump straight in to 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 Catherine's presentation. Yes, I think okay. we can. Thank you, thank you, Sinclair. Um, we have uh, we can I think proceed with the first presentation. Solomon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the first presentation, who will also be introducing the abstract, is uh, Dr. Uh, Catherine Becker. Uh, Becker, Dr. Becker, uh, take take the floor, please. Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can, I can hear you. Uh, I just had some trouble with my presentation, so I can't. I can't uh, show the PowerPoint the way I wanted to, but I will just improvise. Um, I mean, it's the PowerPoint I wanted to show, but it's, I can't just open it. Uh, otherwise, I don't see my. Yes, you can see it. Okay. Sorry. Okay, can you can you see my PowerPoint now? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay, thanks very much for uh, letting me present today. My name is Katrin Becker and in my presentation today, I would like to draw attention to the phenomenon of disembodiment that underlies the conceptions of law and subjectivity in the context of blockchain technology. I want to point out to what extent this entails a new understanding of law, which doesn't only concern the virtual sphere of blockchain applications, but has implications for general questions of law and legal subjectivity. In this context, the term disembodiment needs to be understood in a threefold way, that is, as an abstraction from the territory, the legal corpus, and the human body. In the following, I will explain why these processes of disembodiment imply far-reaching problematic effects that need to be discussed. Um, Lex Cryptographica is essentially constituted by the quasi-legal structure of smart contracts. Contract stipulations or rule sets are negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the will of the respective transaction partners and the conditions of the individual situation. They are executed automatically and, they're in, and therefore in no need of enforcing institutions. This law thus operates entirely detached from the traditional central in intermediary, that is the cultural and national basis of legal legitimacy, its legal corpus. Ideally, we are told this leads to the creation of decentralized borderless virtual nations or cloud communities. I quote, People could band together and set rules for their own governance, collect taxes and distribute wealth in ways the group believes is fair. Communities could form into nations unbounded by geographical boundaries and governed through a set of algorithmic rules that can be both established and enforced through voting mechanisms and smart contracts. 
What is here not seen, however, is that by removing the territorial basis, these communities abolish at the same time the basis of to agree. Do you still see my PowerPoint? Sorry. Hello? Okay. Can you okay. still see my PowerPoint? Hello? Yes, we can. No, we can see okay. you. We can see you. Not the problem. Can you? But can you see the PowerPoint too? Uh, no, your PowerPoint has disappeared. PowerPoint has disappeared. Okay, just a second. Don't know why. Okay, is it back on? Yes. Yes, I can see it now. Okay, thanks. Uh, it is the contingency of our spatial temporal presence that forces us to agree on a common worldview with those we happen to share our existence with. To ensure a peaceful life, we are obliged to co coordinate our vision of the world with those whose views might differ from ours. We have to agree on a common representation, which is then inscribed into law. By creating opt-in legal systems, the need for compromise for del deliberation on what values the law should represent is removed, and thus its democratic basis. Secondly, blockchain law implies a form of legal subjectivity that abolishes its corporal reality. We are dealing with the idea of a virtual subjectivity freed from all institutional and other heteronymic constraints. With regard to its legal activities, the subject obtains the power to define individually and on a case-by-case -case basis the rules of its, ex of its existence. It is able to operate globally through legal structures that are legitimized through peer-to-peer -peer processes. I quote, just because you live in a particular geography should not restrict you to certain government services. In that sense, the subject is conceived of as not only being detached from the heteronymic sovereignty of state and law, but eventually also from the heteronomy of its own body. One might argue that this is of no relevance as the applications of Lex Cryptographica only affect the virtual dimension of the blockchain. Taking a closer look at the current developments, however, we need to realize this. Even in, even in its virtual disembodied dish dimension, blockchain law does have a relevance with regard to the real, real world. Let me explain in detail. We are dealing with a robotized law, ultimately a system of programming, which covers everything that can obey or comply with its algorithmic rules. Meaning, the main condition to becoming an integral part of this legal system is to be programmable. A condition that due to the Internet of Things is about to be met by an increasing number of actually material, physically present objects. But this means that Lex Cryptographica increasingly has the capacity to leave its virtual scope and to extend into areas of material presence. What does this mean for the subject? Due to its unprogrammable nature, the subject's body, his, her physical presence, necessarily remains excluded from the legal system of blockchain. But, is, but it is yet no less concerned by its scope of application. Especially with regard to blockchain-fed property, the physical presence of the self-sovereign virtual subject is very much affected. I quote two examples. Smart contracts could be used to, to autom automatically check a decentralized online identity platform and digitize criminal records to assess whether the person satisfied certain preconditions that define who can and who cannot own or use guns. More drastically, smart contracts could be tied to an internet-connected gun, which could only be operated if these preconditions were met. The second example, thanks to a distributed ledger, certain data could be used to prevent automated doors from opening for people whom a smart contract risk assessment service rates below a threshold of de desirability. The concept of legal personality that emerges here fundamentally contradicts the traditional concept of legal personhood, which is defined as unity of body and mind. By integrating the individual's body into the corpus of law, by giving him the status of a fiction, the legal institutions of a society usually guarantee that the body is not treated as a commodified object. With regard to the blockchain, this changes. 
As a non-programmable object, the body has no place and is non-existent in the universe of Lex Cryptographica. With regard to the blockchain world, the body remains in a dimension of unrepresented presence. With the increase of smart objects, the unrepresented body is confronted with a new form of programmed, automatic and ultimately robotized presence. Regardless of the protection of the body and the tra traditional rule of law, these kinds of confrontations between unrepresented presence and robotized presence should demand our attention. Whenever blockchain exercises its legal power, it comes with the risk of triggering clashes between two different kinds of presences, between two different legal systems. Ensuring blockchain's compliance with existing legal systems is therefore not enough. It proves to be a simple remedy for what turns out to be a fundamental division between two different types of organizing presence. And this di division urgently needs to be addressed. Each request to bridge blockchain law with legal systems and their overarching ideals should take into account the role of the body and territory. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, thank you, Catherine. I'm trying to unmute myself. Okay, right. So if you have question, there is the option for question. Uh, if you look at the, the tab on top of the, uh, on your right-hand side of the screen, uh, you could ask question. Please uh, do ask questions so that uh, uh, Dr. Catherine Becker will be able to um, answer you. So Solomon, the plan is that we ask uh, Professor Davidson if he has any question for Catherine. Okay. Yeah. If he has no question, then we can move on to the next speaker. Okay. Um, I just want to say, Kat uh, Catherine, are you are you optimistic or pessimistic about the incorporation of this technology into legal into current legal systems? Do um, you think it's going to be a, an easy path or or a difficult path? Uh, I mean, I think it's already on the way with uh, all these legal uh, legal tech applications. I just think that lots of um, lots of theoretical questions are not being asked. To what extent law is actually uh, able to be transferred into into algorithmic structures? And um, yeah, I. I, I'm pretty optimistic that it will that the applications will grow, but I think uh, there have to be more questions raised as regards to what this means for for um, matters for for conceptions of or co the concepts of justice and um, yeah, I think I think there needs to be um, I think it's really like um, like we heard in the introduction that this is a matter of interdisciplinary research that we have to mm. have lawyers, philosophers, and so on uh, work together to see what can be transferred into the blockchain and what shouldn't be transferred. Yes, um, and sort of at a at a sort of a personal level, is there is there a lot of academic legal interest in Europe in this technology? Because I know it's not very much in Australia. Uh, there is definitely. I mean, I um, I work at the University of Luxembourg, and Luxembourg is very keen on implementing uh, blockchain on the on a state basis and uh, yeah, in in on the in the economic economic field. I um, yeah, I just I always think that it's uh, difficult to to see to what extent these um, permissioned blocks blockchains still. Uh, keep the value of the of the, the original idea of a blockchain to uh, to empower the the individual and um, yes. I think that that's something that needs to be looked at more closely. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q and A, um, and I can't see any raised hands. Um, so we can move on to the next. So I, th so I think we can move on to uh, Simon. Thank you, Catherine. That was magnificent. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello. Hello, Simon. So uh, next we have uh, Simon Herko, who is the president of the Travel Spirit Foundation, going to talk to us about uh, uh, mobility and, and the blockchain and technology. So Simon, please, thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Um, so today I, I'm going to present the findings of my, uh, it's a short three month feasibility study funded by the Geospatial Commission, which is part of UK Cabinet Office and also in partnership with the Innovate UK um, research, UK research Council infrastructure. And, and um, to give you an idea of where we are, we, we started in January with some basic principles observed, um, but are making rapid progress thanks to the support of Warwick Manufacturing Group, who are providing us uh, deep advice on, on the implications for the automotive supply chain, Travel Spirit Foundation on mobility as a service, and also from a tech perspective, founders of the Manchester Blockchain Society's PIRA, um, to really together um, formulate the technology concept into an actionable blockchain architecture. And this architecture is um, centered around the Hyperledger Borough code stack selected for a variety of reasons including its um, ethereum virtual machine compatibility ease of deployment and auto scaling features and as a real world application of blockchain our project is gaining strong momentum propelled by the growing climate emergency which is being picked up across almost all age groups and whether that concern is directly for the climate or for some of the underlying issues which relate to climate change. This includes uh, grassroots support from civil associations and climate action groups across South Warwickshire and Canterbury, which are the regions we are um, luckily to be hosted as test beds for our work. The solution we have researched scores very highly on University of Birmingham's use case indicators for permissions blockchain. This includes a score for the appropriateness of blockchain to the use case we've proposed, but also another score comparing the use case of other um, use cases already assessed. And this is really due to a clear and through the research validated need for a neutral intermediary to consolidate parcels from competing commercial operators in the context of, in the UK, a deregulated postal service, which has been the case since 2006. The most efficient way in communicating the real world solution we are seeking to support is via this short animation. We're, we have developed this de uh, based on uh, research of a representative sample population of a hundred people living within um, South Warwickshire and Canterbury. Thank you. 
So our research has undertaken in the context of considering this world, real world opportunity to transform last mile deliveries in our test bed locations of Stratford-upon-Avon and the city of Canterbury. The first two questions uh, we have uh, to answer have been helping us drive innovation in the application of blockchain, which we'll explain shortly. And then importantly, the third question we've asked ourselves is to validate a carbon-based case for deployment. While many blockchain projects before us have examined the tracking of goods through the supply chain, surprisingly few consider the use case of creating a shared platform for competing carriers to use common transport infrastructure for the last mile. More so, the research to date on urban consolidation centres, which this concept, this concept applies to, are focused entirely on larger cities. This contrasts with our research that is applicable to over 300 towns and cities across the UK, similar scale to Stratford-upon-Avon with a population of 30,000, up to Canterbury with a population of 80,000. Altogether, such settlements and their semi-rural hinterlands represent well over 30% of the UK population. The current scenario, which we showed in the animation, involves national carrier firms engaging last mile couriers through gig economy contracts. While our micro consolidation centre would not add operational complexity, in fact, it would simplify um, the, the process um, very clearly, they do create contractual complexity with an extra intermediary in the process. So what we did was have a look at the opportunity which blockchain could provide to use smart contracts. And that in doing so, we've been able to maintain, in many cases, reduce the contractual management burden for this new operating model of shared transport infrastructure between ca competing carriers. This is supported by the transparent business logic and enables the carrier to maintain the customer relationship to the door, i.e. what this technology enables us to, to provide carriers is complete invisibility. And what has really pushed the boundaries of existing research literature has been the need to execute the commercial agreements between carriers, consolidation centre and couriers based on a fully authenticated proof of location. This has been made possible by fusing the authenticated navigation message from the European Galileo satellite system and the identity management features of Hyperledger Borough to prove the receiver's location. Finally, to secure a viable blockchain network of known participants, our real world application linked to the climate emergency is helping us rapidly gain support from both public and private sector organizations. With a strong environmental and commercial case developed and reported back to the UK Cabinet Office, and presenting our findings today. Our hope is that we will gain support from local and regional governments, combined with the Hyperledger community, to take our experimental proof of concept to the next level of prototyping. That was fascinating. Um, I really loved the animation. Um, I'm. I don't want to put you too much on the spot here, but why is this a blockchain solution and not just a very good database? Um, that's sort of my first question. My second question is, 
isn't there the threat of centralization where you've got everything coming into the micro delivery pickup point? Um, aren't you centralizing when we should be decentralizing? So those two questions, if you very quickly, just a couple of thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yes, part 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 of the um, work which we've been doing for the past four years is, is to simplify and help people, organisations understand blockchain. And it's really interesting because at the heart of blockchain is, as you say, a, a database. It's a shared database, but that's actually where our, our, uh, we, we find business models really, and existing business models really struggling with that core concept um so so very much so yes we we we, we are providing a shared database um but with that comes uh, many research questions for us to develop further on um such as G, uh, compliance with gdpr um, data access management to to reassure that that that, that can all work um, so, so yes, um, the, I, if the question is, um, uh, could this not be done with a centralized database? Um, our, our, our belief that is, is that it can't. And, and that's because we must be able to um, provide this as a um, neutral intermediary. And we need to be able to provide transparent business logic, um, which enables the, the, the carriers to buy into the price which we're going to um, charge them and, and that there needs to be some uh, way of um, having a decentralized governance structure to to achieve this without central government regulation and um, so hopefully that kind of covers some of the questions but 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 but, but for sure you know it's a, a really good question and, and that's that's a core part of our research was actually um validating whether blockchain was even needed but we we we, we have found that that in in our case we we believe um it, it, it is in answer to your question about the threat of centralization i guess our our, our our philosophy around this project has maybe been a little less about i know a lot of blockchain has been developed out of a uh, philosophy between centralization and decentralization and that led, led to Bitcoin and the the idea of uh, complete permissionless networks um, and for me um, we we are exploring a different philosophy is is whether whether we are as a society acting in a self-centered way versus becoming decentered and decentered is different from decentralized. Decentered is something as an individual we, we, we all need to take on board is um, how do we think of others? How, how do we act in our society for the benefit of all? Um, and, and that's really the philosophy which we're, we're developing here. If we, can, if we can do this and demonstrate that there are a better way, we, we want to challenge the current um, profit driven model which is driving us into extinction okay and we've got two questions from Trish in the q a uh, 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 sinclair may not have time for the audience uh, questions uh so sorry. i think we can move on to the next one okay sorry about that um sorry simon thank you very much for that um there are questions in the q a if you could have a look at them and maybe post an answer um if you if if you're able to in the q a and we'll move on to uh tim weingartner from lucerne university of applied science and arts um who's going to uh, uh speak up next uh, uh thank you professor thank you uh just uh, have to sort this out a little bit here uh, because of the sharing of the screen. So, can you see my screen now? Uh, no, not yet. Yes, uh, not yet, but we can see the slide. But we can see you. Oh, OK. 
Okay. Yes. <laughs> now you can see the screen. Uh, oh. Yes. No. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. Welcome everybody uh, from snowy Switzerland. We got just snow today. So I would like to present uh, our research on identity of things. Um, so our research was performed together with uh, Siemens Switzerland, where my co-author uh, uh, Oscar Kamenzin works. And um, the problem we address in our research is um, the the history and also the um, the uh, where uh, um, devices or IoT devices come from and what's the history uh, was, because. Um, this is a big problem nowadays uh, since the number of IT devices rises uh, strongly um, that nobody knows where those devices have been and what's their history and also the origin is it really the, the manufacturer that um, claims to, uh, to, uh, the, to is the manufacturer of the device. So our solution to this is the identity of things. So giving um, those IoT devices and identity and, and therefore also showing where they come from and uh, where they have been installed and a little bit about their history. Um, we used a design science method, so we um, worked on a prototype for, um, for this solution and we also used blockchain. Uh, in our research, we compared the traditional approach where we uh, use um, X509 uh, certificates um, provided from a certifying authority and, um, and storing them on the device. Uh, the problem here is that we have some kind of root certificate the company provides. And if, uh, if somebody steals this root certificate, all those devices um, have the problem are impacted and uh, we, we need to to restore the certificates and since the devices are already uh, built in for example uh, uh, buildings or or uh, sites uh, this is a huge effort so from our side we um, uh, used a self-sovereign identity approach where we have an issuer the manufacturer we have the holder, which is the device itself, and we have the verifier, which is a so-called registrar working on the, uh, the customer side. Uh, and we used a blockchain in our case for, uh, for, the, um, for the implementation. We used an Ethereum uh, private blockchain to store um, those certificates and, and proofs. In our case, we, um, uh, we, we established uh, six use cases. So uh, first of all, the, once the manufacturer has to register on the blockchain itself as a manufacturer, um, and after this step, um, the manufacturer can register new devices on the blockchain on his site, and then we are also on the customer side, we have the so-called registrar, which handles the whole registration process for one customer site, uh, which first also has to be registered on the blockchain. And afterwards, uh, devices who are built in the customer site can be assigned to the registrar. Um, we have a, a slightly different assignment um, process for devices um, which don't have an or uh, or locations where we don't have a direct internet connection. So, for example, if we are in in some kind of, of uh, cellar or um, or low ground, that we uh, can still uh, have the assignment process and register this assignment on the blockchain. And um, the last, the sixth use case is the transfer from one registrar to another registrar. So, uh, for example, if a building is uh, sold to another owner, that uh, all the devices for building can be transferred to a new registrar. So, uh, I just want to show you again this uh, journey of a device. Um, on the manufacturer side, 
uh, the device gets a private key um, and the public key is stored on the on the blockchain and then after shipment uh, this assignment or a bootstrapping process between device and registrar is performed and um, via so we use um, java web tokens uh, for this so um, the exchange of those tokens between device and registrar and registrar and the blockchain is done and in this case it's not only about trust between uh, the device and registrar, but also the other way around. So um, not only the registrar should trust the device and its history, but also the device should trust this customer side. Um, in our um, research, we, as I mentioned, uh, we use design science. So uh, we implemented a prototype uh, for uh, for the traditional certificate, the X509 certificate, and also um, for the self-sovereign identity, where we use DIDs, decentralized identifiers. Um, this MASA, the Manufacturer Authorized Signing Authority, this concept is that uh, everything works very well. We can uh, use the technology and we also come over the, the hurdles we have uh, from the traditional certificate process. Um, the only topic uh, where we come up broad, uh, the, the problem aside from our research uh, we detected is um, that we have some kind of transparency about uh, how many devices are uh, manufactured from manufacturing and also from uh, at the customer side some kind of transparency about devices which are installed. Especially the first uh, part can be a problem for some manufacturers who don't want to share uh, numbers of devices uh, that are produced. for your attendance and um, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Th thank you, Tim, for that. Um, I, I was thinking in terms of um, uh, manufacturers not wanting to share information um, with, with obviously their, their competitors, more or less, um, had you given thought to um, uh, registering the devices using zero knowledge proofs so only the owner of it can necessarily see it but other people can know something was delivered but not know the the the, the route or what it was would would would, would that assist um, in, in in adoption identity of, uh, for example, the manufacturers, and if I can track down how many, uh, for example, um, uh, registrations have been done uh, from a manufacturer side, I also can uh, track back how many devices are registered. So I think zero knowledge proof, um, yeah, sounds appealing, uh, but you really have to, to look in the technology of zero knowledge proof that um, it doesn't disclosure those those kind of numbers. Um, we also looked at uh, using uh, separate blockchains for the manufacturer registration and also the, the customer registration with some kind of exchange. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I don't see any comments in the chat or Q&A. And no raised hands, so uh, um, I think you, you you've, you've blown them away. Um, let me just make sure that there's nothing. No, no, I can't see it. So thank you very much, Tim. Thank you very much, 
uh, Simon, and thank you very much, Catherine. Though, though those were very interesting uh, presentations with uh, good ideas, um, and it, it's, uh, it's. I mean, we should be encouraging academics to 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 get more involved in what I think is is, is this very exciting area. And speaking of exciting area, the uh, Bitcoin is just over fifty eight thousand US dollars each at the moment, so that is good news too. It's dropping. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, I'm, <laughs> unfortunately, well, in the last hour or so, I, I've seen it uh, drop and rise again very slightly. So uh, <laughs> it's it's below the sixty thousand US dollars it was on Saturday. Um, I don't know if all of you are used to the lobby. Uh, the moment we end this presentation, uh, look for the lounge. There are tables there. Please have a conversation. If there are questions you need to ask directly to the presenter, uh, please present th those questions to them Why at the lobby. Uh, try to socialize there. Uh, I'll meet all of you there. Uh, the next presentation will be coming up in a short while. Uh, for the meantime, Let's all head to the lobby. Thank you, uh, all the presenters, and thank you again, Professor uh, Sinclair. Thank Thanks. you, Solomon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Nassim, we are heading to the lobby. Okay, all right. You can end the session. Okay, great. <laughs>